We just finished looking at standing waves, but they were all transverse waves, waves that occurred on strings or stiff rods, uh, things like that. And if the medium was fixed on both ends, like a guitar string, you could get a standing wave when two waves are passing by each other. The red wave is moving to the right, the blue is moving to the left, and as those two waves occupy the same place at the same time, they produce a standing wave. And as long as the standing wave started at a node and ended at a node, it would be the right wavelength to be in step and a standing wave would occur. This red one here is the largest wavelength that would fit. That's called the fundamental frequency or the first harmonic. The orange one here is the second harmonic or the first overtone. And we have a variety of different ones that would fit. One thing to remember about waves is that the wavelength is equal to the velocity of those waves divided by the frequency, but all those waves travel at the same velocity. So the shorter or the smaller wavelengths would be the higher or the bigger frequencies. And the largest one that would fit would be half of a wavelength. The next largest, the second harmonic would be one wavelength or three halves wavelengths or four halves or five halves of a wavelength. Um, but those are some conditions that would be where both ends are fixed. If both ends are free, it has to start at an anti-node and end at an anti-node. And this would be like a, a metal rod that uh, didn't have to be held taut at the ends. But as long as it started at an anti-node and ended at an anti-node, uh, it could have nodes in the middle, but uh, the same wavelengths would also fit. Half a wavelength fitting into that medium or two halves or three halves or four halves or five halves, and that goes forever. The other condition we looked at was where something was free on one end and fixed on the other end. And the wavelengths that would produce that, well, this red one is the largest that would fit. That's the fundamental, the first harmonic, and that would be a quarter of a wavelength. The next one would be three quarters, the next one would be five quarters and seven quarters or nine quarters, as long as it was odd multiples of quarter wavelengths fitting into the length of that medium, it would satisfy the condition of starting at a node where it's fixed and ending at an anti-node where the medium was free. Okay, but now that, that was just a little review of transverse standing waves. Now we're gonna do that with longitudinal waves where we don't have crests and troughs, we have compressions and rarefactions. So here I'm showing two different waves. They have the same wavelength but they have different amplitudes. This would be a loud sound, and this would be the same tone, but fainter, less loud. And if this is contained in a tube, that compression would just go on forever and ever and ever down the entire length of the tube. But if that tube had a cap on it, like it is closed at one end, the wave is gonna come down here and it's gonna collide into that fixed end. So if there is a cap on the tube, if, it, if the tube is closed, uh, it's analogous to being fixed, like we had with transverse waves. But waves would also bounce back if it wasn't fixed, if it just stopped right there and was open, a portion of the wave would bounce and come back as well. But as those waves come back like this, there's a series of waves going down, there's a series of waves coming back, and as they come back, those waves are going to interfere. There's waves going down, there's waves coming back, and as that wave comes back, it interferes and creates a new type of wave that doesn't really appear to be going places, it just appears to be bobbing back and forth in place. And that would be a standing wave. And the length of the medium has to be the right length so that the waves going down, bouncing and coming back arrive in step with the waves that were going down in the first place. Okay. Now, we can notice a couple things here. 
where I've drawn these green lines here, you see the molecules of air are not moving at all right there, or there, or there. Anywhere along there, there's no movement of the molecules. And that would be a node, or analogous to a node, for a transverse wave. Now at that node, the pressure gets less, and then greater, and then less, and then greater. Uh, as those molecules come together and spread apart at compressions and rarefactions. But the wavelength is going to be very similar as we had for transverse waves. In fact, it is so much easier to draw um, transverse waves with just crests and troughs as it is to draw these animations, which really do take a lot of time. But if I draw this here, I start at a node, and I go through a node, and end at the next node, that would be one complete wavelength. Okay, From one node to the next node is only half of a wavelength. Or we could have drawn it from an anti-node past an anti-node to the next anti-node, and that would be a whole wavelength as well. It's just like going from crest to trough to crest again. Okay. And so here I'm drawing the same thing, but this wave down here uh, is a different wave. It doesn't have the same amplitude as the previous wave. Okay, it's, it, I'm sorry, it didn't have the same wavelength. I did say that wrong. So going from one node to the next node, that's just half of a wavelength. And you can see the whole wavelength here is a lot longer than one whole wavelength up there. But again, if the length of this tube, the length of the medium, if it's the correct wavelength, then the waves going down will bounce and come back and they will be in step. So when the tube is capped or closed, it's analogous to being fixed. If there was no cap on the end of it and the tube was open, it'd be analogous to being free. Okay. So here I have this going back and forth. It's free on this end, it's fixed on this end. And there's a really neat demonstration you can do. If this is a tube like this, you can drill a bunch of little holes in that tube and then fill that tube up with natural gas. Seems like a bad idea, but it works out okay. What happens is you'll get these little fingers of flames that um, are higher in some places and lower in other places. And we have to be careful how we interpret what we're seeing there. It looks like here is a crest and a trough and a crest. And from the distance from here to here looks like it's one wavelength. It's not. It's only half of a wavelength. The reason being is these flames are going high here when the air comes together and compresses. But a moment later, the air rarefies and that flame, which was high a moment ago is going to drop low. So where the flames are really high, it's, drop, it's, it's expanding up and then dropping down, up and down, up and down, every time these come together and spread apart. The flames in here are staying more the same height because the air is just going back and forth and isn't appreciably um, changing the pressure like it is at these nodes. And what that does is, well, I, I have a video of those flames. So this is my tube with the sound in it. And you can see that those flames are jumping up and down as they go in, in, in high speed. But as I've slowed it down here in slow motion, we can see that the flames are jumping from two different positions. So look at this here. This is my whole tube. I've got a speaker on this end with vibrating back and forth. I've got a wooden cap on this end. One thing I've done is just, I didn't drill the holes all the way down to the end here or here uh, because it gets really hot and I didn't want my little latex glove on the end of there to melt or, or the wooden block over here to catch on fire. But watch what happens as I introduce different frequencies of sound into this tube. If a particular frequency has the correct wavelength to fit inside that tube that is open on one end and closed on the other, you can get a standing wave. And look what it does. So I have to dial in different frequencies, but if I get the right frequency, like right there, I can get a standing wave. And higher and higher frequencies, shorter and shorter wavelengths, but these are standing waves.
those tall flames are bouncing up and down between two locations like that. This is called a Rubens tube. It's a pretty neat demo. And this is a neat device which takes advantage of a standing wave of sound, but it uses ultrasound frequencies that are higher than what we can hear, which are frequencies higher than 20,000 hertz. But this is a whole array of individual little speakers, and they're vibrating back and forth here uh, faster than we can hear. And there's a whole array of speakers up there, but they're very carefully tuned to make a standing wave in between there. And it's just air, you can't see it, but you can balance little styrofoam balls right there at nodes. Okay, and there's going to be a variety of different nodes there, but those this is called acoustic levitation. Really neat thing. And so this red line here is my speakers that are going back and forth here, and there's one in the top here. So this would be kind of like a standing wave in a tube that is open on both ends. This little styrofoam bowl has this high pressure area that develops underneath it and it pushes it up. And then as it starts to fall back down, it gets pushed up again. So they just levitate there, although they are bouncing back and forth between different positions. Acoustic levitation, pretty cool stuff. All right, now let's, before we can move on to more complicated problems, we have to understand the speed of sound in air. It's related to the temperature of the air. So these are representing air molecules and they're just bouncing into each other, going all these crazy different collisions. But if the temperature of the air were at a higher temperature, the average kinetic energy of those molecules would also increase, okay? And kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared, okay? So if they were going twice as fast, or let's say if they were going four times as fast, they would only have twice as much kinetic energy because kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. But if the air were warmer, these molecules would be traveling faster and a wave could pass through that medium faster if the molecules are going faster. And a good approximation for the velocity of sound in air is 331 meters per second. That's at zero degrees Celsius. But as the air gets warmer and warmer and warmer, it goes, the velocity of the sound gets greater and greater and greater. In fact, for every degree Celsius that the temperature increases, it goes 0.6 meters per second faster. So if it's 20 degrees Celsius outside, about room temperature, that's going to be 20 increases of 0.6, and this, the speed of sound would be 343 meters per second. Three, 331 plus 0.6 times 20 gives us that number. If it was much colder outside, I mean, that would be a nice winter day, five degrees Celsius. Um, the, temp the speed of sound is going to be uh, considerably slower, only 334 meters per second. And an interesting thing about the speed of sound is it only is related to the temperature of the air, not the density of air. So these orange um, balls here are representing molecules of air that are warm, and the blue ones are colder air. But I have this row up here which has very few molecules in that row, and then lots of molecules in this row. I did show a similar animation in a previous video, if you remember that. But as the wave passes through, if those molecules are traveling fast, well, the wave will get there much sooner, okay? If the molecules are traveling slower, it takes a lot longer to get across, but it didn't matter that there were fewer molecules, less dense air, the wave traveled at the same speed. All right, so here's a neat demonstration where you can take a tube, like a carpet, um, cardboard tube, and all you have to do is hold it over the top of this wide mouth Bunsen burner. Now that's gonna be some pretty warm air raising up there. Let's say the temperature of the air is 100 degrees Celsius. That's gonna make the speed of sound 391 meters per second. But that hot air rising up is like a rarefaction rising up through that tube, 
when it gets to the end of the tube, some of that rarefaction is bouncing and coming back down, and you have two waves passing by each other. Look what happens. Make this really neat tone here. And if I did it with a little longer tube, a lot longer wavelength, a lot lower frequency, and then if I do it with a really long tube here, you're going to hear that it falls into a high pitch for a moment, and then it falls into a lower pitch, and that's because it was making a standing wave that was um, maybe the second or third harmonic, but then it fell into the first harmonic. So let's, let's do some calculations here. This tube is uh, 78 centimeters long, 0.78 meters long, and it is open on both ends. So it has to start at an anti-node and end at an anti-node, the fundamental frequency. And we, we just measured earlier, the speed of sound was 391 meters per second if the air temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. And because it's open on both ends, that's only half of a wavelength. So uh, the whole wavelength, velocity divided by frequency, or rearrange that and say frequency is velocity divided by the wavelength, the whole wavelength would be twice that medium. So we would hear a tone of about 250 hertz. This tube here is 180 centimeters long, 1.8 meters long. And again, we're just rearranging this equation for frequency. So velocity divided by wavelength. It was open on both ends, so it was only half a wavelength fitting in there. That would produce a frequency of 109 hertz, a lot lower frequency. And then this really long one here, uh, right at 80 hertz, was the wavelength we were hearing. And this is a, a pipe organ with all the uh, ex pipes exposed and stuff, exposed so you can see. And some of those pipes produce frequencies lower frequencies than we can actually hear. If it's under about 20 hertz, we can't hear it, but you can feel the ground shake, and it adds to the emotion of stuff. But all these different tubes are different lengths so that we can uh, hear a variety of different frequencies. If you've ever played with these, maybe in middle school music or something, uh, they're called boom whackers, and they're just these uh, plastic tubes that are open on both ends, and you just whack them against the table and they make a tone. And this is supposed to be the, the note C, and this is also C, but this one was half as long as this one. It's open on both ends, so the wavelength that fits in there is only half a wavelength. But if I put a cap on this end, a little plastic cap, and close that end off, the standing wave no longer starts at an anti-node and ends at an anti-node. Where it's capped, it has to end at a node. So that's not half a wavelength anymore. It's a quarter of a wavelength fitting in there. And if a quarter of a wavelength fits into that medium and half a wavelength fits into this medium, those two wavelengths are going to be the same wavelength. They'll be the same frequency. So here we are. And I'm going to hit them in the table. You can see one is much lower tone than the other. But if I put a cap on the end of it and then whack them, they're very close to the same tone. And that's just because it changed from open, open to open, closed, or free and fixed. And you may be familiar with um, blowing air across the top of a Coke bottle. You flutter the air in here, it makes a nice tone, and that's because you're making a standing wave in there. You might also know that if you fill that up with some Coke or just water or something, uh, the shorter and shorter it is, the higher and higher frequencies you could make um, by blowing across the top there. But now we understand that this is a tube that is open on one end, and that water is like a cap on the end closing that end. So that distance from here to here is going to be a quarter of the wavelength of that sound. So we can take that to our advantage. Let's say we had a tube here and we want to fill this up with some water and not guess at it. We want to use a ruler and measure how much water we should have in there so that we hear the note C, 523.23 hertz. And that's going to be C an octave higher than middle C, which is often tuned at um, 
uh, 261.6 hertz, half of that. Okay, but let's let's use a ruler here and measure what how much water we should have in there so that when we blow across there, we hear the right tone. We're going to say that we're going to do this at room temperature, so this is the speed of sound. And I want to hear this frequency. So I know the velocity and I know the frequency. Let's figure out what wavelength it's going to be. Well, it's going to be about 65.6 centimeters um, or 0.65 56 meters. So the distance from here to here needs to be about 65 centimeters. Is that right? It's not quite right because the distance from here to here is only a quarter of a wavelength. If that tube is a quarter of the wavelength of the sound, we found out what a whole wavelength is. So the distance from the water here to the opening here needs to be a quarter of that or only 16.4 centimeters, 0.164 meters. And that's, that's quite doable on a little Coke bottle like that. That's what it would be if it was at, zero, at 20 degrees Celsius. If it was at zero degrees Celsius, the speed of sound would be a little different. So the wavelength would be just a little different than what it was before. So a quarter of a wavelength would be a little different than it was before. You do have to tune these based upon the temperature. Another neat device is called whirl -a tune and it is just this corrugated piece of plastic tubing, these ridges in there, and as you swing this thing around like this, air is flowing over this surface and air is flowing over that surface because this is going around like this and this end is close to the center, it's only going that way. But air is flowing over that surface fast, this surface a lot slower because it wasn't going as much distance. And Bernoulli's principle says the faster the air flows over that surface, the lower the pressure on that surface. And air is going to travel from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. So as we whirl this thing around, air is going to be moving down the length of the tube like this. Those corrugations, those ridges in the tube is going to cause the air to vibrate and the vibration is going to fall into a standing wave because those are the only ones that can really sustain themselves. So it is a tube open on both ends, and those are a variety of different standing waves that could occur. The faster the air moves through there, the faster the vibrations, and it will fall into higher uh, overtones. And boy, I tell you, it's nice to know physics because you can understand some pretty neat phenomenon. One time I was at Home Depot and I was getting these pipes because I was going to work on the downspouts um, for the rain gutters at our house, and I strapped them to the roof, not planning on um, having a musical adventure on the drive home. But as I was driving home, air was hitting those tubes, and I, as I drove out of the parking lot, I was going about 25 miles per hour, and I heard boo, and then I went up to about 50 miles per hour, and I heard boo. And then I had to try 75 miles per hour, and I heard boo somewhere in there. Um, but th this is just like a whirl of tune. The air was vibrating in there, and I heard this fantastic tone, and I understood what was happening. But um, I think a lot of people may not have, but it was a, a pretty neat day for me. One last thing we can do here is we can take a tuning fork, and this one here is at 512 hertz, and we can hold it over a tube that is filled with water so we can adjust the length of the tube. And if the length of the sound coming off that tuning fork is a quarter of the length of that tube, it will hit just that water just right, bounce back in step with those, and a standing wave would occur. Okay, And I could also hear one if I had not just a quarter but another two more quarters or three quarters altogether, I would hear a standing wave there as well. If I raised it up here again and had it stop right there, that would be two more quarters, five quarters altogether, or seven quarters, and we can hear a standing wave, uh, which is just going to be this loud sound because standing waves get really big. And um, I will know when it is a standing wave when I hear that loud sound. So maybe it's a little hard to see in this picture, but this is a graduated cylinder filled with water. So that's the water level right there. 
and right here is a clear plastic tube. And if I hold a tuning fork over the top of this, uh, the distance from the rim of that tube to the water wasn't quite a quarter of a wavelength there. So if I held a tuning fork over there, I wouldn't hear a loud sound. I am going to hold a thousand hertz over the top of this, not the 512 that I showed in this picture. Okay, I'm going to hold a frequency of a thousand hertz and watch what happens. Right there, you can hear it. And then we're going to move past that. And when we get to a node right there as well, we can hear it again. Okay, so if I measure how much distance there was from here to here, and say that was 17 centimeters, from one anti-node to the next anti-node was only half a wavelength. So half a wavelength was 17 centimeters. The whole wavelength was 34 centimeters, or 0.34 meters. We just measured the wavelength of that sound. But knowing the wavelength of the sound and the frequency of that sound, we can find the velocity of that sound. So 1,000 hertz times 0.34 meters is the um, wavelength. We just use this device to measure the speed of sound, and I think that's pretty cool. So fun things we can do with standing waves, longitudinal standing waves, in tubes that are open on both ends, closed on both ends, or open on one, closed on the other, and there you go.